Welcome to Sustainability Now, solutions to shape a world that works. Designed for everyone interested in responsible stewardship of the planet. Covering food, energy, housing, water, waste, health, economics, and consciousness. Welcome to your community, Sustainability Now, with your host, Mira Rubin. Welcome everybody to Sustainability Now, technologies and paradigms to shape a world that works. I'm your host, Mira Rubin, and it's my pleasure to introduce you to Dennis Tekarek, co-founder and chief commercial officer of Arky Reef. Arky Reef is a nature tech startup that restores coral reefs with proprietary 3D printed clay reef tiles. Dennis has founded a total of three startups, which have spanned enterprise technology, environmental sciences, and e-commerce. And Dennis, I am so glad to have you joining us today. Welcome, welcome. Thank you very much, Mira. And I'm very excited to be here as well. Uh, well, Carl, Carl is something that we've probably heard about the the bleaching of the coral reefs. And um, I don't think that we really understand what an issue it is. Uh, and maybe you can just give us some background on the coral story, and then we can go from there and talk about what you guys are up to. Yeah, sure. So I think corals for many people, partially probably because they're submerged, uh, and less visible to us than say trees, for example, are um, a bit of a mystery. Um, so I think in that sense, to me as a, in this particular case, as a non-technical co-founder of this company, I think it was a mystery a few years ago as well until I kind of got exposed to it. To give maybe the listeners a bit of a background on the importance of corals, maybe a good starting point would be to understand what they actually mean to the world. Um, some of the statistics, and I don't, I don't want to you know bore you with too many numbers, but uh, looking at sources like the Nature Conservancy, for example, you'll find that corals have a number of functions, uh, one of which is providing food. Um, it, it's said to be a food source for about 1.2 billion people around the planet, so that's quite significant. Um, it's also uh, got a purpose in, in protecting our coastal, um, uh, our coastal cities from the likes of tsunamis, for example, um, and it is believed that corals save more than $270 billion in spending that we would have to redirect to the likes of sea walls or key walls or anything along those lines. And finally, uh, maybe a bit more tangible, corals also act as a source of tourism income and tourism dollars. So when you look at the statistics, it's said to have a value of about uh, close to $40 billion a year uh, in, in tourism dollars. So as you can see, um, both to, I guess, society um, and to the economy, corals are very critical, and that's one of the things that many people don't actually understand. But um, given, given that they are critical, to us at Arki Reef in particular, it's very, very important to preserve them. Um, because if you look at the recent statistics in particular, you'll see that corals are dying at an unprecedented rate. Um, so I think the last 50 years, if I'm not mistaken, uh, we've already lost around 50% of the world's coral cover. Um, and if we continue at this rate, um, scientists believe that by the end of the century, we would have lost around 90 to 100 percent of corals. And again, going back to the initial statistics and the value that they bring to the world, you could just imagine how much of a detrimental impact that would have. Thank you. Thank you. I read some other really interesting statistics that corals are responsible for covering maybe one percent of the planet and are responsible for 25% of the food source or, I mean, it's just crazy. And um, that there is such a thing as coral mining. Yeah. And I think that that's interesting to consider too, what kind of impact we're having through our mining of this really precious resource. I read uh, that Carl is called the rainforest of the sea. Yeah. And, and so do you know anything about the coral mining? Uh, I've seen some documentaries on mining of red coral, for instance, for the purpose of jewelry. Yeah. Um, I think that's something that's being done in, uh, in the Mediterranean in particular. 
um, and that's uh, to to develop some sort of uh, precious gemstones or um, some sort of, I guess, essentially jewelry. Yeah. Um, generally speaking, I, th I think the larger threats to corals are probably the ones that are um, a bit more tangible, I guess, as activities. Well, actually, um, part I've got all this new information, so I got to share it because it's an education for me. I really appreciate this opportunity with you to explore this area. But coral mining is it's mined for um, building materials. They yeah. they burn it and create lime with it. And there are areas where it's been a primary building material and it's been less expensive than other materials. So it actually has created a lot of devastation, way more than the jewelry uh, arena. But what happens is that it destroys the solid foundation that the coral need to grow on, which mm -hmm. brings us to you. <laughs> um, but before, before we talk about what you're doing, the innovations that you're making, let's look at uh, what are the threats to corals? Why are they dying? Yeah, sure. So I think uh, the most obvious threat is climate change. Uh, so we've heard, I think the most prominent um, sort of statement we hear around corals dying is coral bleaching, um, which is basically um, rooted in, in higher temperatures in the water. Um, but then uh, I would argue that several a lot of people actually don't look beyond this. Uh, because it's an easy, it's sort of an easy statement to make that coral bleaching is the main source for corals uh, dying off. But if you really look into it, some of the big stressors in uh, parts of the world where we operate, for example, also include the, li the likes of uh, deep sea trawling um, activities where, you know, uh, bottoms or sea bottoms that would have been rocky turn into deserts of some sort. And thus they uh, make the substrate that corals require to grow on, they make that disappear. Um, similarly, if you look at maritime activity or even dredging or activities that are happening in and around the water, all these are bigger disturbances to, or arguably bigger disturbances to corals in an active sense than the change of climate uh, exclusively. And then I think all of that put together, we always look at um, sedimentation as being the main stressor. So. The idea that uh, what what wasn't a desert turns into a desert, sedimentation um, becomes more prevalent, and that then doesn't really uh, provide the right environment for corals to settle, uh, to spawn, to attract other, you know, uh, to recruit other corals to those colonies. Um, so ultimately, there's then a lack of of a substrate, um, uh, which would be the rocky sort of foundation that corals need. So. Coral is spoken of as an animal, which is very interesting, right? And um, I was reading there are polyps that collect together and they have a symbiotic relationship with algae. And that's where the colors come from. At least that's, am I speaking yep. out of turn or? Okay. Yep. So when the bleaching occurs, the corals are expelling the algae and then they don't have anything to eat and then they die too, right? Yeah. <clears throat> so what you are doing with Archi Reef, tell us, tell us about that and the innovations about it, because there are all different technologies right now of trying to restore corals. So tell us about you. Yeah, so we focus on hard corals in particular. And uh, when it comes to when it comes to the area where we innovate, it's to do with what I referred to earlier as the substrate. So see that as a um, as a foundation. Uh, and if you imagine that typically uh, an ocean floor has a suitable foundation for corals to settle on because they don't have roots, they're not, they're not plants, they're animals. Uh, so they need to find a rocky foundation and something that is actually suitable for them to, to um, live on um, and recruit other corals even to, to join that particular colony. Uh, what we do is provide that substrate. So we create these uh, reef tiles, or we refer to them as reef tiles that you could almost imagine as it as though we are um, sort of tiling a bathroom floor, um, but our purpose of doing that is creating a foundation rather than rather than um, any decoration or any 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 architecture in that sense. So uh, we have these hexagonal reef tiles that are about sixty centimeters in vertex, weigh about maybe twelve to thirteen kilos each, um, and we place them at this on the uh, bottom of the sea. 
um, and then we put coral fragments on top um, so they can they can ultimately have a much stronger foundation and with that foundation in place they can continue doing their traditional job in an environment that is now suitable for them again so when it comes to our work in at times you see areas in the ocean where there is basically very limited life uh, and very limited um, you know very uh, a crazy amount of sedimentation uh, and then we come in and put uh, put these put these tiles in place uh, that then turn that particular area into a much more suitable place for corals to settle on and we help that process along by bringing the coral fragments in, in at the beginning uh, but we don't cultivate any corals so we're not we're not in the business of uh, cultivating or of uh, uh, growing corals we're just in the business of providing the perfect foundation for them and you said you you do put in the coral fragments or not we do we just place the coral fragments but we often work with uh, local environment agencies for example or local entities that handle that for for any given country or any given geography um, and it's uh, with those parties that we work with as far as obtaining the uh, coral fragments is concerned. Uh, and we don't get involved in the process of them growing those fragments in, in what's typically known as a coral nursery. So we just work with those entities and bring those fragments to our tiles. And how are the corals anchored to the tiles? Uh, the tiles are, they, the top layer of the tiles have uh, pockets. So it's a very porous uh, sort of setup, which is, again, porosity is something that's very important for corals. Um, and there is enough space in between for them to basically, it's it's almost like you're docking them in, um, but you do that with, uh, you do that with uh, the pockets that are available in and around the top layer. So in, I've seen these tiles. I have so many questions. Um, we can start with the foundation, the shape of the tile, because probably people are imagining bathroom tiles that are flat. And this, this is not like that at all. But before we get to that, um, what, why hexagonal? Is there any particular significance to that shape? Uh, I think hexagonal doesn't really carry any any particular significance, but the layer on top of that hexagon does. So the layer on top is a what we refer to as a biomimicry layer. Um, so we we mimic biology um, uh, or given marine biology. In this particular case, we have a replica of a platygyra coral, um, which is a, a species of or a species of coral that is. Uh, known to be dealing with stress very well uh, with people, people know that as brain coral it kind of looks yeah. like a brain correct so okay. the brain coral is known to be dealing uh quite well with uh sedimentation stress so it kind of uh works for for our purposes um so the hexagon shape in itself just offers offers itself up well to um to being part of a, like a, a modular structure so one hexagon placed next to another hexagon, you can create these larger uh, shapes that way. Um, and that's ultimately a better side by side and offers more stability than if they were, let's say, rectangles, for instance. So there is a little bit of a architecture driven uh, approach to it, um, whereby we feel or we know that the that the hexagon uh, uh, lends itself better to what we're doing in, in terms of doing modular shapes. And in fact, wasn't this project, it was through the University of Hong Kong? Yes. Was it? And, and it was blending of biology and architecture. So it, nature tech, I love that, uh, that uh, term. Yeah. It's, it's bringing the best of us, hopefully, to really collaborating with nature as you said, biomimicry. So describe these wonderful tiles and the process of making them through the 3G extrusion, would you? Yeah, so, and, and again, that's a, that's a great point you just made on, on the sort of junction of architecture and biology, if you will. Uh, we always call ourselves, and to an extent, we call ourselves an eco-engineering company as well, uh, because we bring in ecology and ecological knowledge and then apply that to sort of the design element that comes from architecture, but then bring in very traditional engineering efforts uh, to make this a reality. Um, the process of us making these tiles is uh, through 3D printing. So they're made of clay. Uh, in our particular case, it's terracotta clay that's very conducive to uh, to coral attraction and coral growth. Um, and Can you we- say why? Why 
terracotta especially what makes it conducive so it's pH neutral. So first of all, it's uh, it it does not have a negative impact on on its surroundings. Um, if you look at seawater, I think you're operating at a pH level of something in the region of eight point six to eight point nine. Um, many concrete structures, for instance, they work at a pH level of around thirteen to fourteen. Um, so if you bring in concrete, th there could be a negative impact from uh, toxicity leaches. Uh, later on in the process, so maybe in year three or year, year four, uh, maybe those structures can become detrimental. Um, so we use terracotta because we don't want that to be the case. So we don't want the material to have any impact on its surroundings. Um, and with its pH levels, I think it works well for us. And that then also becomes an attraction for the corals as well. So it, it becomes an immediate, once it's installed, it becomes an immediate sort of ocean attraction, both to corals and even fish. Um, and, and they feel drawn to it. And the way they're designed helps the fish to also use it as shelters, for example. Um, but back to the back to the production process. So when when we so ultimately the way it works is we bring in these materials and then the materials are mixed and brought to a what we call the ideal density of that material, and then uh, we feed it into a an industrial three D printer that then three D prints these. Uh, uh, in 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 alignment with a sort of an algorithm that's get that gets fed into the 3D printer, um, and then the shapes come out. Um, and then once they once they come out, I think each of these tiles takes about maybe uh, 45 to 60 minutes uh, to produce, and then they come out to dry, and they dry for about two weeks before they then get uh, uh, fired, and then they're ready for deployment. So that's roughly the process. Um, it sounds easy. But um, there's so many errors uh, that could that could happen along the line, including uh, an, an unfit density, for example, as I mentioned before, if the mixing process isn't done sort of perfectly, um, the tiles break uh, and they don't they don't really uh, hold up for long enough. Um, you know, if there's if there's uh, the material, if it's fed to the 3D printer in the wrong way, if there's an issue with the extrusion. So there's a number of uh, elements along the production process that could go wrong. Um, so it's very important for us to uh, to work with people who are, it's a very, very sort of narrow field of expertise. And it's important for us to work with those experts in the field to be able to deliver these tiles. But yeah, that's essentially where we produce from our own facility and using, using these methodologies. So I want to ask you, where can people go to see the video of these tiles being printed? Because it's absolutely fascinating. Um, so there, there are some videos online. So on our YouTube channel, for example, there are elements or, or snippets of, of our production facility. Um, this particular production facility or the largest that we have is based in Abu Dhabi in the uh, UAE. Um, so you can, you can find some uh, online footage there. Uh, especially on the on the mentioned YouTube channel of Archie Reef. Um, and so I think that, people would just go to YouTube and search for Archie Reef. Yeah, and then I think you within the second or third uh, search results should be from directly from our account. Okay. And then you'll be able to see the uh, parts of the production facility. There's also a video about the opening of that particular production facility, so you'll be able to see how the 3D printer actually operates. Wonderful. And how about why not give people your website? We'll put these links on on our website when we post the interview. But sure, sure, sure. The website is simply archireef.co. Uh, co. OK, it's really worth checking out these videos there. It's fascinating. And what they end up looking like is sort of like brain Carl. They're they're how how high would you say they are? Uh, so that depends on the site. Um, they can be as high as uh, I'd say fifteen to twenty centimeters. Wow! But they can be they can be maybe half the size in some parts of that of one particular deployment. So we try to put many of them into one area next to one another, and depending on how the current uh, uh, how the currents are in that particular geography, for example, we would put them together in a way whereby maybe the center forms some sort of a dome. Uh, so those tiles would be would have higher legs or longer legs than the ones that are surrounding it on the outside. So it just depends on the area and the currents, okay. uh, and what we feel is right for the protection. And so how do you anchor them to the ocean floor? We normally don't. So we normally don't anchor them. So the 
and that's again going back to the hexagon shape this is where it helps so the idea that they stick together um that they kind of support one another as uh, as a as a whole structure um keeps them in place and the weight of you know 12 13 kilos uh, is good enough to hold them down in some of the most i'd say uh, most stressful parts of the world so in hong kong uh, where we have a number of these in the water, you could you experience regular typhoons, uh, similar to hurricanes in in Florida. Um, so you'd have you'd have probably about five to six um, significant typhoons over the year, uh, and they stay in place. And then in Abu Dhabi, where we also have uh, deployments, you have the Shamal winds. So despite these despite these stresses, they stay in place without the need for anchoring. Um, but we can. If you know, if we come across a site that is even more extreme in its uh, in its uh, movements, then we could anchor as well because we could just put the put the legs down essentially. And so, can you talk about how you were mentioned the algorithm, yeah. and that you can use different algorithms for different sites, or um, that you can mo make modification? I understand pretty easily, and then print a new version. But can you? Give us a bit of an idea of how you said that um, they're designed, the tiles are designed to resist sedimentation. And like, yep. so people can picture it a bit more clearly in their heads. What does that mean? What is specific to the design that allows it to resist sedimentation? So again, I think if you, if you again, the, I, I guess the listeners won't be able to, to see it unless they go online, but um, the there are a lot of holes. If to, to put it very, simply like a lattice right yeah but yeah not it's not a symmetrical kind of lattice yeah and and i think the uh the idea is that if there is any sedimentation from these activities like a typhoon or or a, a hurricane or or any of these winds uh the benefit is that the sand sifts through it it doesn't stay on top of the structure um so there is there are a lot of holes in that sense i it sounds a bit simple but i think it's uh it's part of the part of the design process to allow for the sand to come through rather than to settle, which would be very detrimental to to the corals. And so you're doing a lot of research and development, right? You're uh, tracking the development of the corals over time. What's the longest standing um, implementation that you have currently? Yeah, so the longest standing is three years. Um, that was in this is that new. Yeah, yeah, it's not. Uh, yeah, it's not. It's not a. It's not a, a long trajectory. But in those three years, in comparison to um, to some of the, I, let's say, more traditional methods of restoration, uh, this method has proven to be to be quite successful. So the measures that we take relate to uh, the growth of the corals. Um, but one of the uh, one of the most, uh, let's say, one of the one of the KPIs that we're most proud of. Is probably the survivorship that we uh, seem to be able to guarantee, or not guarantee, but to, to secure over that time. So in those three years, um, at this oldest deployment, we're doing about ninety-five percent survivorship, wow. uh, which means that only five percent of the corals of the fragments that were initially planted uh, are no longer in place. So that's that's if I'm, I'm not mistaken, that's maybe about four times higher than uh, some of the more traditional methods, including. Uh, more um, conventional uh, concrete structures that don't have this level of survivorship. In those cases, it can often lead to a survivorship level of maybe 20, 25%. Wow. So that's something that we are probably uh, quite strong in. Um, but again, it's three years, so I can only talk about experiences worth three years. Well, it's still pretty dramatic. Very yeah. dramatic. So let's talk about your business model, because you've brought your background from software as a service, Internet of Things, uh, circular economy, you've brought all these, these experiences that you've had to play in the development of Archie Reef and the business model. And I think it's a very exciting business model. So how about if you share that with us? Yeah, so the business model is... Uh very much like a software implementation rather than a rather than an environmental project or product um so we charge for a setup fee 
according to the to the amount of tiles or to the amount of square footage that the clients go for. Uh, we have pre-designed packages of 20, 40, and 80 square meters, and they then um, correspond with a certain amount of coral fragments saved, for example, a certain amount of performance to be expected from them, and so forth. And then each of our clients gets into a subscription with us. I mean, I guess for jokes at the beginning of the of this journey, we called it Reef as a subscription. Um, again, I don't know if that's if that's uh, appropriate any longer, but uh, the idea is that uh, the clients sign up for at least three years and pay us an annual fee, and in return for that fee, they get a lot. They get um, a sort of a comprehensive data set uh, from the performance of the reefs um, that includes both uh, uh, tangible and intangible materials, but mostly relate to the client's needs to report against some sort of environmental uh, targets that they have, whether that's in line with their local policy of the country that they're in, or it's in line with uh, more commonplace frameworks uh, like TNFD, for example, or the United okay, Nations. So what What's TNFD? It's the Task Force for Nature uh, for Nature Related Financial Disclosures, I think. Wow. Um, that's, okay. that's quite nascent, but if you look at the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, it's one other framework that some companies uh, really, really uh, focus on. And when they want to report against it, they need some data to back up what they what they actually talk about. And one of those SDGs, Sustainable Development Goals, is uh, life below water, for example. And that's where we come in. Um, but the benefit of this in, in the business model, the benefit of the subscription with us is getting that data and being able to report that with the help of our scientists. Um, against specific targets that they might have. So that, I guess, makes it a bit more innovative. So that brings in more questions. Obviously, with that level of subscription, you're not, your client is not the layperson, not the general public. Who, who are you working with? Who are your clients? They are typically large corporations um, that either uh, need, have a need for mitigation uh, for work that they do in and around the water, uh, or or those that uh, that have very strong environmental targets, regardless of of its you know of its particular focus, whether that's in the water or uh, uh, or on on land. Um, so it's it's larger corporations. To give you a few examples, we work with um, Sino Group, for instance, which is uh, one of the biggest real estate developers in Asia. Um, yeah. yeah, based out of Hong Kong and Singapore. Um, we work with them, and they have very, very strong environmental targets that they that they want to achieve. So we are one of the solutions that they deploy in order to work um, towards those targets. Um, in places like Abu Dhabi, as a client, for instance, we have um, ADQ, which is a large investment holding company. Um, again, they also have a very strong appetite for uh, you know environmental performance. Um, and they they then work with us in in a very similar way in in obtaining data and in understanding the potential impact that they can have positively speaking from deploying our structures. So we then provide that back to them. So how do you how do you monitor the tiles and the production of the corals, the health of the corals? How do you track it? Yeah, so we do a number of things. We do something uh, called photogrammetry. Uh, so we create what's called a digital twin of the um, of the deployment. So let's say we deploy 200 reef tiles in one particular area. We then take uh, thousands of images on deployment day. I think it's something in the region of 5,000 images. And from those 5,000 images, we, um, we create a digital twin. Um, and then using, uh, using some logic of computer vision, we then compare that to the development that would have taken place, let's say three months after, or maybe six months after. And from that, we can uh, we can highlight things such as uh, the total co coral coverage, um, growth of individual corals. Uh, we can look at fish populations and whether they are growing or, or uh, settling on the site, for example. So that's one of the ways that we, or one of the ways in which we generate data. So um, is, that, is that digital twin, it's all computer generated or is it actually being data driven from the site? 
it's data driven from the site. So we we need to, yeah. So we need to, when I say 5,000 images, that it really just takes a diver about 10 minutes to do that. I see. Uh, but the diver would have to dive over the site and continuously take photos so that there are no gaps. Um, and then we take those photos in and then create this so-called digital twin. Um, and then we compare that to its progress over time. So we say month one, this is how it looked, month two, month two this is how it looked and so on. And from that, we get an understanding of coverage. Uh, but we can we also go deeper and do something or work on something called environmental DNA. Um, so we take DNA samples, environmental DNA samples from the site um, using something called ARMS, which is an um, which is a unit that's placed on the site. And that unit collects, you could see it as something that collects DNA traces over time from invertebrates, from fish, from any type of local populations that are turning up on site. And we gather that data and then process it in the lab and then compare it uh, with the time stamp, stamp to one another. So that way we can uh, kind of understand, have we had a positive impact on the biodiversity, for example, locally? Uh, what type of DNA have we seen or did we see in month one? What type of DNA are we seeing in month six? Um, you know, what are the differences? What are the improvements? Uh, what are some warning signs that we need to be careful about? Um, so it's these types of data points that we can then generate. And ultimately, we're now working on turning that into a more digestible and tangible dashboard, which includes all of these things in one place for our clients. So they can actually have a sort of performance overview of, of the coral reef. Wow. And, and so what are you seeing in terms of transformation in the three years for the one site that has been there that long? Yeah, so you, you see that uh, it's so to a lot of people, fish is, uh, is an interesting marker. Um, we internally don't really put that uh, uh, on the top of our priority list. But typically when we work with clients or when we work with government entities, the conversation of fish comes up a lot. Sure. Um, how do we bring back fish populations? So that's something we can definitely see. Uh, the impact on fish populations is quite immediate, um, but maybe for reasons uh, that are less obvious. For example, like I mentioned earlier, they, they, the tiles serve as a shelter of sorts. Um, cuttlefish is a good example. Cuttlefish are very timid when it comes to laying their eggs. So they're very selective, but they do lay their eggs under our tiles because they feel as though they're protected there. Um, so these are some of the immediate impact or pieces of impact that we have seen. Um, but I think over time, it's generally to do with the fact that we make a contribution to the uh, immediate local biodiversity in the area. So some of the biodiversity invertebrates that are coming on site, for example, or um, or even the corals that are being attracted, new corals that are being attracted and recruited for the site, uh, that's something that you don't see immediately. So over time, you'll, you'll see an impact where biodiversity grows both in abundance uh, and in diversity. Um, but that's something that's very, very difficult to measure. So we don't really have hard numbers on saying, you know, your biodiversity went from six to seven uh, over, the, over the last year. But we're trying to work on making that a bit more digestible too, but um, it's a very, very difficult uh, set of numbers to to make to to only report on from a uh, from a quantity quantity perspective. Um, it's it's something that also in you know incorporates a lot of qualitative data, which isn't that easy to digest. So we are seeing an impact, but uh, most of the impact relates to the biodiversity in particular. So as you're as you're producing all this information that's going to the corporations that are subscribing to yeah. their tiles, are you also is it all going to some kind of central research foundation that's going through all the information and collating it and distilling the trends and such? Yeah, so we always work with and again, we only have two geographies that we serve at this stage. That's Hong Kong and the UAE. Okay. Uh, and in both those geographies, we also work with the corresponding environment agencies. Um, so the, a lot of the data that we generate, that the clients generate, become open source data um, so that others can benefit from it too. Um, but yeah, to answer your question, it comes in, it, it, it is used for research purposes as well that go beyond the needs of that corporation. Yeah, um, and I would imagine. Um, yeah. 
And that's typically part of the agreement that we strike as well. And you're kind of in collaboration with the um, the coral nurseries, right? Or yeah. because you have to have a source of the coral to be able to populate the tiles, right? Yeah. So talk about that a little, would you? Yeah. So typically coral nurseries, and again, I don't know where how this is all around the world, but in our locations, typically they're run by public entities uh, in the locations that we serve. And coral nurseries are simply designed to create more coral. Um, so that's coral cultivation. Um, and it's it's uh, in the water, it's submerged. And you could almost see it like people gardening at the at the bottom of the, you know, at a depth of maybe five to 10 meters. And they're creating more and more coral fragments down there. Um, we, what these uh, entities typically struggle with is outplanting them. So growing them is one thing. But then they need a, need a solution. Again, going back to the original conversation, they need a substrate to put these in. Um, and that's essentially how we work together with these entities. So we go in and say, okay, you guys are doing the work on the cultivation side. We can help you. Uh, uh, we can help you leverage that. And we can help you uh, put in place these corals that you've put so much work into. Um, so we can give you the substrate. And I think that's where we, every time we work, even with a private entity, uh, a public entity is involved. So typically it's always a public private partnership. Uh, we haven't had a situation where we simply work with a um, with a corporation without the buy-in from the from the environment agency. And I'm thinking that it's parallel in some ways, in a lot of ways to the notion of tree planting, if especially if we're talking about it as the uh, rainforest of the sea. Um, I was reading that there's some research being done on how to balance the the different corals that we don't want to monocrop corals any more than we would want to monocrop trees. Do you is there any insight you could give us around that? That uh, so okay in in I've got into that in mangroves a little bit, but I think in corals um, it applies in most ecology work that you don't want to do that you don't want to just focus on one species right. species so um yeah i think the same applies to corals so when we when we work with those nurse, nurseries we uh you know we have platagyra we might have we might work work with acropora which is another type of coral so we we mix it up um but yeah it's 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 similar to like you said tree planting to some extent but I think the outcomes that we're driving are quite different from, from tree planting. I would argue that tree planting is, I don't want to say easier, but it's easier to digest at the very least. Um, so that makes that makes our process a bit more complicated, I'd argue. Um, but yeah, when 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 it comes to the actual process itself, we try to not do a monoculture. So again, that's something that those nurseries already work on anyway. So it's very rare that you'd see uh, government-based nurseries that would be only focusing on one particular species. What is your vision for Archie Reef and for expansion? Because you said you're in two markets right now and you're dealing with big corporations. I, I think that the opportunity for the public to get involved would be phenomenal. You know, like a... Um, a monthly donation for instead of planting trees, planting reefs. Yeah, I mean, that's in some markets, I think, say the US market, for example, that would be something that would be very exciting. I think um, there is there is a lot of uh, maturity in, in doing these kinds of things in the US, which I wouldn't say also applies to other other locations that we're in. So the US would probably be the prime location that we would look at when it comes to something like that, where the public could make a contribution, whether that's through crowdfunding or uh, opportunities similar to crowdfunding or where we say we have targets and then we work against those targets, um, that would be possible. But again, it would also include the buy-in of the local environment entities. Yeah. So say, for instance, if we were to work, wanted to work in Florida, we can't just turn up and say, hey, we're going to uh, put in these structures in the water. Uh, you know, they need to they need to validate that they work in their location. And they have the responsibility, the environment agencies have the responsibility to give us the green light in the first place. But if that was the case, then yes, uh, part of the future would be to focus on getting the public involved more. But I think generally for the company, it's it's about 
It's about trying to finance as many of these deployments as possible in the shortest time frame, because with each deployment, we have a positive impact. And I think that's where, where our focus lies. And we found that right now, the private sector, uh, I don't know if this is a temporary thing, but right now the private sector has a strong appetite in doing this. And I kind of, in, in some areas, I commend them on working with us because unlike other products that deliver, uh, environmental products that deliver, um, let's say, uh, uh, credits, the likes of carbon credits, we actually don't. So um, at times it's it's fascinating to see these companies work with us and have the faith to say, okay, maybe in the long run, there will be something that we gain from this, or we'll, we'll, we will maybe just make a contribution to something positive. So that's that's very interesting, and I think the future is in us doing that more often, and maybe building something like coral highways in the long run, where we have these modular structures and we go, okay, we've we've got these little villages of of uh, corals. Why don't we uh, why don't we now connect them via highways, um, and even have more opportunity for for corals to be planted on, and then turn what again used to be a uh, used to be a rocky bottom or rocky sea seabed back to a rocky seabed so that's um so yeah. when you're bringing up highways it's making me think of development right and and so that also prompts the question how are you determining these the different development sites what kind of criteria are you using and how do you determine the the potential impact because I imagine like with our development we develop things so haphazardly that we create more problems than we're solving at yeah. oftentimes yeah so we do uh, very detailed site analyses before we even go on so in in the locations that we work in we have a good overview of what areas work and which areas don't work so well for for uh, active restoration um, so uh, we use satellite imagery to begin with uh, and then we cross-reference some of the figures that we need. We, for example, look at uh, water temperatures, pH levels, salinity, wave action. Is there any development work going on near the areas? And all the factors that could lead to uh, a negative impact on the corals, we try to we try to mitigate them. So we try to make a really, really solid choice on the site. Um, on a site that also probably wouldn't, we, we even take into account what would happen if this site warmed, for example. Um, what can we do? What can we do about that? Is there an area? Is there a pocket uh, slightly deeper in the sea where we could move the tiles to mitigate for any activities or any changes like that? Um, so all these factors taken into account uh, lead to sites that are ultimately most suitable for 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 our deployments. And that helps us to at least in these, I mean, again, we only have three years worth of experience, so I can only talk on those three years. Um, but in that particular case, or in those particular cases, we've been able to uh, really find the right sites uh, for, the, for real impact. Is there any potential of negative impact from developing a coral reef? Uh, from my understanding, no. I wonder. I wonder if our how complete our understanding is, but I mean, it it would seem that it would be unlikely that there would be a negative impact. But yeah, it's, and it's, again, going back to the going back to the site analysis, if again we we could, uh, for the sake of I think for the sake of just pure business success, we could also worry about that less if we wanted to, but I think we define as to whether the sites in the first place are suitable or not. So if the sites are not suitable maybe then if you were to go in and do something, maybe that could have a negative impact. Um, so that to us is very important that the site in the first place is suitable and is accepted by not just us, but also by um, scientists of those environment agencies as a site that is suitable for what we're doing. And yeah. that process takes a while. Yeah. Yeah. It, I'm thinking about uh, key species and the impact of a key species, it, like reintroduce, reintroducing the wolves, for instance, in Le uh, Yellowstone, transformed everything. And it seems that this is that kind of acupuncture point by by cultivating the corals and supporting their growth that you create a thriving ecosystem. It's yeah. like regenerative agriculture, like re reconditioning the soil. And then all this other life comes, right? Yeah, yeah, that's a good analogy. Yeah, 
It's pretty amazing. Cause we talk a lot about regenerative agriculture, but we don't talk very much about what's happening in the ocean. Yeah. So um, is, is there any plan to expand to other markets? Uh, yeah. So um, again, I think it's, it's the nature of a startup that we can't stretch too far. Right. Um, I don't want to really, I don't really want to make bold statements. Um, but I think just from a pragmatic perspective, like I said earlier, we we're in Hong Kong uh, and we're in Abu Dhabi or the UAE. Um, one of the more natural expansion markets for us is Saudi Arabia, um, just based on its uh, geographic location, as well as the uh, ability to work in the Red Sea. Um, and because there is a lot of development work going on in Saudi Arabia at the moment, solutions like ours will will likely be needed um, to counteract that. Um, so that's a that's a very natural expansion market. And then, as I mentioned earlier, Florida um, is something that we would be yeah we would be quite interested in um, as long as as long as we can go through the you know through the through the um, red tape if there is any. How can we help you? Um, I, I mean. I, for starters, I would like to understand what the appetite is, what the agencies are that want to work on this in the U.S. Because we've we've come a lot of we've come across a lot of U.S. agencies that do this type of work outside of the U.S. Um, you we know, can but- connect you. I just I just had a conversation with uh, someone who is we're going to be interviewing from a bird sanctuary, and they collaborate with multiple coral cultivators right in Florida. So. Yeah. Yeah, that would be, I'm all for that. I mean, anything we can do to help you bring it here sooner and and have it be like a crowdfunded sort of venture, it would be amazing. Instead of adopt a whale or ind- adopt a tree, we could adopt a reef. And I think people would be very hungry for that. You know, that would be great. That would be very good. Yeah. Yeah, it's exciting. It's a very exciting prospect. So how can we reach you, Dennis? Um, me personally, you can reach uh, probably best on LinkedIn. Okay. Uh, yeah, if you type in my name, I think you'll. Um, uh, I'm always happy to connect. Will uh, you spell it for us so people can? Yeah. So the first name is D E N I Z, and then the last name is T E K E R E K. And Beautiful. when you type it in, I, I, because it's quite rare, so I, I should be the one coming up. And how uh, about the Archie Reef w- website? That's arcureef.co. So A-R-C-H-I-R-E-E-F.co. Um, and yeah, you can reach us on that too. And there's a submission form on that site too. Okay. And are there any questions I should have asked you, Dennis, that I didn't? Um, no, I think I think this was very comprehensive. I think uh, very detailed. Um, yeah. Well, it's been a pleasure. And thank you for the education and for the wonderful work you're doing. And the, um, I, I just love the blending of technology, architecture, biology. It's a beautiful thing. So thank you, thank you, thank you. And thank you to all of you who are listening and spreading the word and also to my partner in crime here at Sustainability Now, uh, Scott Billy, who is also our producer. And until next time, live your best life, love the world around you, and together we can save the world. Thank you for listening to Sustainability Now. Visit sustainabilitynow.global to find resources related to today's program. While you're there, pledge your support by making a contribution to help us shape a world that works. And remember to subscribe, share, and follow us on social media.